I want to ask you to grab a Bible and open with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. And as you do, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your most holy word. Continue to conform us to the likeness of your son to change our affections and our attitudes. Increase our faith, we pray. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Well, long distance online dating relationships can be rough. They're increasing, no doubt, but they can be very challenging. Just ask Alexander Peter Sirk, who lives in Holland and a handful of years ago had fallen for a Chinese woman that he had met online. And fed up with the distance between the two of them, he was intent to finally meet this woman face to face. And so he got a visa, he booked a flight, he flew 5,000 miles to see her. He had sent her a picture of his itinerary, but when he arrived at Changsha Airport, she was nowhere to be found. Convinced that she would eventually come for him, he decided that he would stay at the airport terminal and patiently wait for her. And patiently, he indeed did wait. In fact, 10 days later, the frail-looking Cirque was taken to the hospital. And what about the girlfriend? Well, a Chinese TV team was able to find her, and she confessed that she thought Cirque was joking about the trip. Though hopefully none of us have had to be hospitalized after waiting for days in an airport on end, the feelings that he must have gone through are familiar to all of us. Those feelings of hopefulness that turns to hopelessness, those feelings of patience that turn into impatience, those things sound familiar. And thankfully, when we are waiting, when we are waiting on answers from God, that we've been praying about, we can know that God has heard us and that he didn't think that we were just joking. But waiting is sometimes the hardest part. Jesus had announced the coming of the kingdom of God. And in Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 5, He is displaying a vast and powerful authority over a variety of things that people encounter in life. And in Mark chapter 5, we see him engage with two people from vastly different backgrounds. Both of them, however, are absolutely desperate. And both of them have to wait to get what they want. So let's read together Mark chapter 5, starting at verse 21. We see a story inside of a story. And this is what it says. It says, when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him. And he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogues, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard of the reports about Jesus and had came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? 
And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they had said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and he went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, rise. I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The account begins with Jesus entering yet another town by boat. And word had gone out before him so that when he had arrived, the beach was already swarming with people. His reputation preceded him, both the good and the bad. To the people, he was seen as a teacher and as a miracle worker. He had healed many and he had just come from the other side where he had cast a legion of demons into a herd of swine and they jumped off the cliff and died. This was the good side of his reputation. But Jesus' reputation was also growing among the religious elite. The scribes and the Pharisees had accused him by this point of many things to go against God. They had accused him of blasphemy, of violating the Sabbath, of performing miracles by calling on the name of Satan himself. And in chapter 4, it says that they were seeking to destroy him. And now, as he gets off of the boat, one of those very same leaders was running toward Jesus. Jairus was his name. And it tells us that he was the leader of the synagogue, the local house of worship for the Jews in that region. And as a ruler of the synagogue, he was well-respected in the community. He was considered to be an elder. He led people in the readings from scripture and he led them in worship. He was most likely wealthy and of high social standing among them. And he almost surely aligned with the Pharisees and the scribes who stood against Jesus. But his situation was desperate. His young daughter was dying. And here, the man of stature and standing in the community, the local religious ruler had fallen down on his knees before Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth begging him to please come because if he doesn't, his daughter will die. And at this point, it's hard to know, but it doesn't seem like Jairus has put his faith in Jesus. He is most likely there out of sheer desperation. The situation was dire. There was nowhere left to turn. He is there strictly out of need. And you know, it seems to me that a fair number of people come to Jesus that way. 
That's the way that some of us came to Jesus. Not in trust, not in faith, at least not yet, but in complete and utter desperation. And if you have ever sensed that feeling, you know exactly what we're talking about. The need was great, and at the time, it seemed like he was the best place to turn. Perhaps it was on behalf of a loved one like Jairus. Maybe for physical need or healing. Maybe it was for a job to provide for your family. Perhaps it was for your emotional health. Or perhaps it was because you had an overwhelming sense of guilt because of your sin. And so in desperation, you ran to Jesus. Jairus is desperate. He set all of his status aside. He set all of his concerns aside. He had exhausted all of the options. He was not just a leader. He was the leader. And he swallowed his pride and he fell down on his knees before this carpenter because of the desperation that he had for his daughter. And what's amazing is that Jesus, knowing who he was, received him anyway and immediately went with him. The crowd had gathered, the beach, And now the streets were packed. They all saw what just happened. And they were pressing in on Jesus, who is now hastily walking through the street with Jairus. Jairus was desperate, but he wasn't the only one who was. And you can almost hear the people call out to Jesus, trying to get his attention, try to have them glance their way to try to get him to do their bidding. And another desperate person comes into the scene. Verse 25 tells us about her. It says, There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately, it says, the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. Jairus had just gotten what he wanted. Jesus was on the way back home with him. But then everything came to a grinding stop. The unnamed woman was an outcast in society. She was the opposite of Jairus. Jairus was one of the elite. She was one of the ostracized. Jairus was rich. She was poor. Jairus had a family. She had no one. And in her desperation, her state is just as severe as his. For a woman to have this type of physical bleeding disorder, that would have made her unclean in Jewish society. Ceremonially, religiously unclean. And as such, it meant that she could transmit her uncleanliness to anyone that she was in contact with. It was difficult enough for a woman to experience the type of loneliness and isolation that this required during her monthly cycle. But this woman had experienced this type of bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. Think about just for a minute what you were doing 12 years ago. Think about all that has happened in the last 12 years of your life. Think about what it would have been like for you for that amount of time to be isolated, ostracized, alone, and suffering. That's a long time, 12 years. 
The Talmud gives a variety of treatments for this type of malady. The Talmud is one of the Jewish writings. And some of these treatments are potions. Others of them are superstitions. Presumably, the woman has tried them all. Everything from drinking the juice of Persian onions boiled in wine to being frightened out of her illness by a physician to carrying the barley corn that came from the dung of a white female donkey. Try to put those pieces together. Waiting and trying. Trying and waiting. Spending what little she had left and waiting some more. In a New York Times article, Alex Stone tells about how the executives at Houston Airport faced and then solved a cascade of passenger complaints that they had about long waits at the baggage claim. They first decided to hire more luggage handlers. And as a result, they achieved an industry-beating average of eight minutes for someone to get their bags. But the complaints persisted. And this made no sense to the executives until they discovered that on average, passengers took just one minute to walk from the gate to the baggage claim, resulting in a hurry up and wait type of situation. The walk time was not the problem. It was the remaining seven minutes of staring at the baggage carousel that became the problem. And so in a burst of genius and innovation, the executives move the arrival gates farther away from the baggage claim area. Passengers now had to walk much farther to go get their bags, but when they arrived, their bags were there waiting for them. Mission accomplished. The complaints ceased. In the same article, Stone interviewed MIT operations researcher Richard Larson, who, believe it or not, is one of the leading experts in the world on waiting in lines. I didn't know there's an expert for waiting in lines, but apparently they are employed by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he wrote about the psychology behind our waiting. What happened at the Houston airport makes the perfect illustration, he says. According to Larson, the length of our wait is not as important as what we're due while we're waiting. Often psychology of queuing is more important than statistics of the wait itself, he says. Essentially, you and I tolerate occupied time, for example, walking to the baggage claim, better than we tolerate unoccupied time, such as standing at the baggage carousel. Give us something to do while we wait, and the wait becomes more endurable, is the point. You know, there's something there for us as we think about what it feels like to wait on God. So you think about waiting on God and how it might feel like unoccupied time. We wait, but the question is, is what is really happening behind the scenes of our life while we wait? And where does our our perspective turn while we wait? Is God actually doing anything? Waiting on God implies developing a new perspective on what God is doing while we wait on him. 12 years, potions and magic tricks. Verse 26 says she suffered much under the hands of the physicians. She's exhausted all the options. She's got no money left. And so this woman, like Jairus, is desperate. She broke all the ceremonial law. She entered the crowd. She pushed her way through, presumably making a bunch of people unclean along the way. And she brushed up against the side of his cloak. And she was healed. And the blood dried up within her. And it all happened so quickly. And... Jesus' hasty walk with Jairus comes to a complete stop. 
Verse 30 says that Jesus perceived that power had gone out of him. This is the same power that stilled the storm. It was the same power that cast out the demons into the swine. It was the same power that healed many, many, many before this woman. The power had left. He felt it. The disciples are confused because they don't feel the power of Jesus leaving his body. So they're like, well, why are you asking who touched me? Of course, they're all touching you. That's the point of why they're here. Dozens were pressed in at that time. But in that moment, the woman knew that she needed to make herself known. And so in trembling and fear, she came to Jesus. And in verse 34, we see the point of the interaction. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Her faith made her well. Not her initiative. Her faith, not her action of reaching out to grab his cloak. No, her faith, as meager as it was, made her well. And that's really interesting because this faith was incredibly simple. I mean, this was naive in some ways. It was uninformed. Her faith didn't understand the details of who Jesus was. It was in some way a mere hope based on a guy that she had heard about that was secured through a magic trick, like an action of touching his cloak. But the object of her faith was the person of Jesus himself. And that tells us something that faith or a life of faith is marked by this kind of desperate dependence on Jesus. And the Lord still works that way today. Sometimes people feel like they can't come to God because they don't know enough about him. Or sometimes people don't come to church because they feel like they don't have all their stuff together. Or they don't come to church because they're scared their kids might not sit still in the service. A couple weeks ago, I had a conversation with a young couple who professes faith in Jesus. And we were, they were asking if I would officiate their wedding. And so I was describing premarital counseling and, and the process that we do to try to help young men and women grow into a godly marriage and therefore serve the Lord and be healthy in their marriage for the rest of their life. And at one point, one of them stopped and asked a question and they said, you know, I really don't know anything about theology. Is that going to be a problem? And it was a great opportunity to explain that you don't need to have it all figured out to come to Jesus. But you do want to grow in understanding of what it means to follow him. You see, you don't need to have an advanced understanding to have faith that pleases God. I'm going to say it again because it's very important. You don't need to have an advanced understanding to have faith that pleases God. It can be simple. It can be desperate. It can be lacking of certain understanding even. Children who have no categories to even begin to think about the eternal trinity or the nature of sacrificial atonement can have faith that is simple in a Savior, Jesus Christ. Adults who have never read their Bible before, but know that they have a need, can have faith in a Savior who will indeed save them. Even an unclean, hemorrhaging Jewish woman who just heard about Jesus exercises faith, and Jesus makes her well. A life of faith is marked by a desperate dependence on Jesus. At this point, you can almost feel the tension that Jairus must have had. Don't stop. Don't stop walking. Keep going. Who cares who touched you? There's everybody's touching you. My daughter might have only minutes left to live. Don't stop. 
And you can almost hear Jesus reassuring him, just wait. It'll be fine. Be patient. We'll get there. And the moments must have felt like ours. Jairus' own faith had just been lifted. He just witnessed the miracle of Jesus with this woman, the very thing that he wanted for his own daughter. Maybe he really can heal her, he's thinking. He thought, but we need to hurry up and we need to go right now. And just then he was informed of the very thing that he feared the most had come to pass. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. The woman had just believed that Jesus would heal her, and he did. Jairus was now in the struggle to believe And upon seeing the healing, there was a glimmer of hope and a kindling of some type of belief. But now he is called not just to have faith that Jesus could heal. He is called to have faith that Jesus could perform a resurrection from the dead. I know you think I'm late. Do not fear. Just believe. I know what you just saw. You know what you just saw. A woman who has been unclean and isolated for over a decade has just been publicly healed and restored for everyone to see. I know you're nervous, but I'm never late. Do not fear. Just believe. Keep believing. Keep believing. And the agonizing Wait, in that type of agonizing wait and the lack of results in my timing or your timing, that's when your faith is tested the most. Is it really genuine faith or not? And Jesus says, keep believing. Henri Nouwen was an author and before his death, he wrote a book called Sabbatical Journeys. He writes about some friends of his who were trapeze artists. That'd be kind of (laughs) cool to have friends who are trapeze artists. They were called the Flying Rodellas. And they told now that there's a special relationship between the flyer and the catcher on the trapeze. The flyer is the one, as you might imagine, who lets go. And the catcher is the one who snatches them out of the air. And as the flyer swings high above the crowd in the trapeze, the moment comes when he must let go. He arcs out into the air, and his job in that moment is to remain as still as possible and wait, and wait for the strong hands of the catcher to pluck him out of the air. And one of the flying Rodellas told Nowen, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer must wait in absolute trust and the catcher will catch him, but he must wait. The girl is dead and Jesus goes to the house anyway. He takes Peter, James, and John with Jairus to his house and as they approach They can hear the wailing from the distance. The morning party is already there. Didn't take long. And Jairus' faith is holding on by a thread, but he still believes. Jesus rebukes the mourners by telling them that she's just sleeping and they laugh at him. They know what a dead body looks like. They know what a dead body feels like. They know what a dead body smells like. The girl is dead. But Jesus wasn't talking about physical death because true and lasting final death is a separation from God. And this girl was not separated from God. God was right there. 
And so her dead body was asleep. But Jesus was going to bring her back to life. And he enters the chamber where the body lay. And here the tenderness of the Savior shines ever more brightly. He was tender when Jairus approached him, a guy who had stood against him, or at least his clan had. He was tender in healing and restoring the woman in the streets. But now he looks at a little girl and he sits beside her on her bed and he gently grabs her hand and he says to her, Talitha Kumi. Talitha is a pet name. It literally means little lamb. It would be like calling your daughter sweetheart or honey. Some of you might call your daughter little one or maybe even little lamb. You know, sometimes our children, like all children, have a hard time waking up for school in the morning. Especially this time of year when you're in the new rhythm and habit of things. And it's one thing for me or for my wife to walk out into the hallway and yell, it's time to get up! Which we do. Sometimes. And it's another thing to sit at their bedside, to run your fingers through their hair, And to say softly, sweetie, it's time to get up for for school. Both are effective. But only one of them is exceedingly tender. And our Savior is tender with those who are desperate. And he's tender with those who need him. You see, the woman had waited a very, very long time to be healed of the bleeding issue. And she experienced a great separation as an adult, as a result. And she must have felt like she was forgotten by God at times as she cried out to him. But God would not be rushed. His timing was perfect. And the tender Savior could have just let her touch the cloak and disappear into the crowd. And she would have been healed. But that's not what he did. He called out and he made her go public. Why? He did so because the fact that she was made clean would then be made known by everybody who witnessed it so she would no longer be isolated. He did so. He made her go public so that she and that all others would know that it was faith that made her well. What a loving type of restoration from Jesus. Jairus felt like the wait was long. He surely must have thought that Jesus had forgotten his daughter. He must have tried to rush him, but to no avail, and then she died. But Jesus' timing was perfect, and his actions were so tender and loving, and helping the Father see the need for faith. He emboldened his faith all the more as he said lovingly, little lamb, it's time to get up. And her heart started to race, and She gave a light, happy moan, as children do when they wake up, and her fingers pressed ever so slightly, and she gave one last tight squeeze of her eyelids, and she opened her eyes, and a smile came over her face. Jesus would not be rushed. And why would you rush someone who had that kind of perfect, tender, loving plan for those who exercised faith. You see, a life of faith is marked by a desperate dependence on Jesus. And you might even be able to say that in the reverse. A dependence on Jesus, a dependence on Jesus leads to a life of faith. Because he has Authority over all illnesses because he has authority over winds and waves of legions of demons, even death. You can trust his timing. Some of you have been waiting for a very long time. You have 
been praying for a family member. Maybe you're waiting for physical relief or longing for comfort in the midst of loneliness, or you're trying to be patient. You're trying to be patient, but the wait is so hard. Keep depending on Jesus in faith. You know, there are some people who are willing to seek Jesus for the smaller things in life, but when it comes to the most important thing, the biggest thing, the need for forgiveness of sin and to be restored to God forever, you struggle and you're reminded here, Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And the opportunity for you is to become completely dependent on Jesus in faith. There are some people who trust Jesus for the most important thing, but struggle to trust him in the daily and most basic needs of life. And these accounts remind you of patience and trust and waiting in your daily dependence. And still there are some who are angry, asking God, why did you allow this to happen? And why are you making me wait? How could this happen to me? This is a thing that happens to other people, not to me. And if he doesn't fix it right now, then I'm not going to believe in him. I'm not going to follow him. And for you, the reminder is that perhaps God is doing something that you can't see and you will not understand until much later, until your desperation leads to dependence. He is never late. He's never early. Do not fear. Just believe. So what is Jesus like? He is the one who ushers in the kingdom of God. He is the one who is the king. He is the one with all power and authority over all things. And he is loving and kind and tender. He functions on his time, not my time and not your time. And he's mighty to save again and again and again. And so you can trust him. You can depend upon him. And in your hours of deepest desperation, you can run to him. A life of faith is marked by a dependence on Jesus. And it is my prayer that your life would be marked by that kind of faith and that kind of dependence. Let's pray. Father, we recognize today that the wait is so hard. Help us to depend upon your son as we wait. Father, we recognize that the feelings of desperation are profound and painful and difficult. Help us today, God, in our desperation to run to the right person, to your son, Jesus. Father, we recognize for some of us that the feelings of apathy have overcome us and we don't even see the ways that we're supposed to be desperate. And today we ask God that you would allow us to feel the right desperation in the right time. And Father, today we ask that you would continue to bolster our faith in this King, your Son, who is all-powerful and is infinitely loving and tender and kind. Help us to trust him. Help us to wait on him. Help us to see him for who he is as he delivers us in our greatest need. We pray in his mighty name. Amen.